Good afternoon and welcome to my presentation. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work. I am presenting an ongoing work, so there are a scope for improvement and I would appreciate your suggestions. My talk is about inference of gene regulatory networks. Gene regulatory networks describe the causal relationship among a set of genes of interest. The inference of causal relationship from differential gene expression data is known to be challenging and is still an unsolved problem. Previous gene challenges on this topic has shown that distinguishing between direct and indirect regulation is a major issue for different inference algorithms. And further, the inference problem itself has often been said to be underdetermined. In this talk, we'll focus on the underdetermined issue. So the accuracy of a inferred network depends not only on the effectiveness of the method, but also on the availability of causal information in the data. If we do not have sufficient causal information in the data, then the prog problem will be underdetermined. And we can ask a few questions regarding the underdetermined nature. So if we know the experiments and if we have the data, are the gene regulatory networks inferable? If it is not inferable, then which part of the gene regulatory network is inferable and which part is not inferable? And what kind of data and experiment do we need to infer the network? We begin by observing the fundamental limitations in what one can infer from the differential gene expression data at a steady state in a gene perturbation experiment, such as knockout experiment. If you have a network like this one, and then you perturb gene A, then all genes which are regulated by A, whether it is directly regulated or indirectly regulated, will have differential expression. So it is not possible to differentiate between direct and indirect regulation from steady state gene expression data. Now, if one has a complete set of single gene knockout experiments and have the differential gene expression data, from there one can get the accessibility relationship or the transitive closure of this matrix. Uh, so if we have a network like this, and we have the complete set of single gene knockout. We can get the transitive closure or the accessibility matrix. And if we have a complete set of double gene knockout and the steady state differential expression data, from that we can get the accessibility matrices for the gene regulatory network where each of the gene has been removed one at a time. So this is the fundamental limitation. However, in real cases, there might be errors in the accessibility relationship. So if the problem we have is underdetermined, it can have multiple solutions. We have seen that yesterday also, that underdetermined problems can have multiple solutions. So instead of trying to finding a single solution to an underdetermined problem, we try to find a set of solutions, an ensemble of solutions where each of the network satisfy the accessibility relationship that is given by the data. If we have some differential gene expression data like this, and from there we can get the accessibility relationship, and there can be many networks which satisfy the same accessibility relationship. And the simplest of that is the transitive reduction. So we can construct an ensemble where the transitive closure 
is the upper bound and the transitive reduction is the lower bound. And this is the fundamental idea behind our algorithm which we call trace. In trace there are three steps. So we assume that we are given the differential gene expression data for the wild type and the different uh, single gene or double gene knockouts. From there, we obtain the transitive closure. In the next step, we do a reduction of the transitive closure. This is related to transitive reduction, but there are some differences. And finally, we combine them to get the upper bound and the lower bound. In this combination, we might need to do some filtering and error correction. And I have my poster. If you have questions about the details for the filtering and error correction, uh, I would invite you there. So in trace, we get the upper bound and the lower bound of the ensemble instead of the ensemble itself. And if the gene regulatory network is acyclic, then the upper bound is the largest member of the ensemble, and the lower bound is the smallest member of the ensemble. And if the upper bound and the lower bound meet, then the gene regulatory network is inferable. If the bounds do not meet, then the inference problem is non-inferable. The network cannot be inferred from the given data. And the distance between the upper bound and the lower bound will serve as a measure of uncertainty in the inference problem. And the edges which are in the upper bound but not in the lower bound can be thought as non-inferable. Now we try to see the a priori inferability of gene regulatory network. In this case, we try to analyze whether gene regulatory networks are inferable even if we know the accessibility relationships without error. We look at the a priori inferability of random networks from complete set of single gene and double gene knockout experiments. And under ideal condition that we have the accessibility relationship without any error. So here I show the results. In the x-axis, I have the number of edges in the network. And here, I show the network distance for the lower bound and the upper bound. And if the lower bound and upper bound meet, then the network is inferable. As you can see that for most of the networks, the bounds do not meet. Therefore, they are not inferable except for small networks. Here, these are small networks where the bounds meet, and this bound meets on a special cases where the number of edges in the network is approximately equal to the number of nodes in the network. Other than that, the gene regulatory networks are not inferable from complete set of single and double gene experiments. So based on this, we do not expect that genome scale gene regulatory networks like for E. coli or yeast will be inferable. And they are not inferable. We tested this under ideal conditions. And here on the x-axis, I have the number of knockout accessibility matrices. We will need double gene knockout experiments to get the knockout accessibility matrices. As you can see that after a few knockout experiments, the distance between the bounds do not improve anymore, and we reach an steadier state. So also for yeast, we reach a steadier state. There is no further improvement. We, for E. coli, we did it up to the 1,500 genes, and there are no further improvement. But I'm showing here up to 50 but there are no further improvement up to 1,500. So we see that most of the double gene knockout experiments do not have further information or they have overlapping information. 
Then we tried on noisy data, and it was from the Dream 4 in Silico Network Challenge for 100 gene networks. We got the data from Gene Netweaver with 10 replicates for a complete set of single and double gene knockouts. And in this case, we could not get the bounds without error. There are some errors in the bounds. However, more importantly, we can see that the bounds do not meet. So these networks are not also inferable from complete set of single and double gene knockout experiments. And the errors in the bounds are mostly involved with fan-in motifs. So if you have a fan-in motif, then there can be multiple regulators of a single gene. And if we knock out the dominant regulator, then there will be some differential expression in the target. But if we knock out a weak regulator, then the differential expression might be compensated by the dominant re regulator. So it is a fundamental issue that we cannot dif see differential expression in case of fan and motifs for all the regulators. Now that we have a measure of the uncertainty in the inference problem, we try to use that to improve our prediction and to improve experiment design. I will illustrate it using a simple example here. Suppose I have this upper bound here and the lower bound on this side. And the difference between the upper bound and the lower bound are in two edges, this edge A to F and this edge B to G. So if we want to test A to F, we can knock out either C or E. Then the indirect path from A to F is disrupted. And the only way gene A can affect gene F is through direct regulation. Similarly, for the regulation from B to G, we can knock out either D or E. After we make a table like that for each of the edges which are in the upper bound but not in the lower bound, we can run an optimization. And for this also, you can find details of the optimization in my poster. I would invite you to ask questions there. And after we do the optimization, we find the knockout by which we can test the maximum number of edges. We tested this as a proof of principle on the genomical network of E. coli. And previously, we could not identify that with complete set of single and double gene experiments. But in this case, if we use design of experiments, then we can infer the network within less than 2,000 experiments. Further, we use the design of experiments for noisy data from GIM4 networks. Again, we had 10 replicates and generated the data using Gene Netweaver. And I'm showing very new data. I got the results uh, last week, so there is a lot of uh, scope for improvement. Compared to previous result where we use the complete set of single and double gene network exp knockout experiments. Here the distance between the upper and lower bound is much smaller and the required number of experiments is less than 3% of the number of experiments for complete set of single and double gene experiments. Again we have some errors in the upper bound and the lower bound and most of them are associated with fan in motifs. Finally, I have some take home messages that only a small part of gene regulatory network is inferable, even when we have the complete set of single gene and double gene knockout experiment available. And we can use the lower bound as a measure for the gene regulatory network. However, it is good to take into account the uncertainty, because if we take care of the uncertainty, then we can use that to design experiment to improve our 
predictions. And we have some problem with fan-in motive and we are trying to improve that. Finally, I would like to thank the funding agency SNF and the members of our group and the audience for their attention. Thank you. Yeah, hi, I was a little uh, struck by the lack of information you get from the double knockout experiments. Um, and I was wondering how much of that you think might be due to the transitive reduction uh, 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 approach you use requires acyclical graphs? And do you have any intuition as to how all of your results are dependent on that? And in particular, if the doubles might be more informative if that would be relaxed some way? Mm. Transitive reduction, in order to do that, we first condense the network and then do the transitive reduction and then we expand it back. So it is not necessary that we always need the acyclic graph. We can do transitive reduction after condensation for cyclic graphs also. However, we need to do some tweaking and you can see more details of the tweaking in my poster. But uh, our algorithm is not limited to a cyclic graph now.